Shabbat Shalom again. And here we are, Shavuot weekend 2013. Great to be in the city of the Great King and uh, having a good time over here. Uh, I'm going to talk about tomorrow a uh, message on the, for, the, the form in the latter rain and a little bit of what we were talking about today, the, the spiritual and the physical and putting those two together. But it's interesting because we know at feast times that traditionally for hundreds if not thousands of years the Jewish people read certain books at certain feasts. Uh, I found it interesting at Passover they read Song of Solomon. Because what it seems is when you look at these feasts, these books really don't seem to fit until you really get underneath the, the cover of why they're reading these books. I mean, why would you read Song of Solomon at Passover? And yet when you realize that the Passover is about Yeshua, and it's about him and his bride and his sacrifice, of course, Song of Solomon is the perfect book. And then Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year. You know, the birds don't even fly in Yom Kippur. And what are they reading? The book of Jonah. You know, because it seems like every other feast they're reading something from the writings, and now they're reading not just a prophet, but this tiny little prophet that probably people don't read more than once in their life. So why on earth would you re be reading on Yom Kippur the book of Jonah? Because the book of Jonah, there's one sign that Yeshua would be the Messiah. And what was that sign? The sign of Jonah. Three days and three nights he would be in the uh, heart of the earth as Jonah was in the belly of the fish. Then Sukkot, Sukkot. You know, the time of festivity and the time of celebration and eat what you want and do all these things. And what book do you think they'd be reading? Ecclesiastes. <laughs> Why Ecclesiastes? You know, vanity of vanities, it doesn't seem to make sense. But when you look, it really makes perfect sense. Because in this world, it is vanity. And the feast really is about the temporariness of life and the real joy. And, you know, that's why Yahweh wants us to eat and to enjoy ourselves in Sukkot. But it's about family. It's not about physical things. And then Chabot. You know, what book do they read at Chabot? The book of Ruth. You know? So, I'm going to explain today why they read the book of Ruth at Chabot. Now, normally, if you look at the book of Ruth, it's a great little book in the Bible, right? I mean, if you look at commentaries and you look at churches from time immemorial, everybody is talking about Ruth. Why? Because Ruth is a great example of a Gentile woman that had this great uh, heart toward the Elohim of Israel, and she leaves her pagan people, and she joins herself to Yahweh, and they live happily ever after. There's only one problem with this story. Biblically, it doesn't fit. That doesn't fit biblically, and we're going to show you why. Let's start in Deuteronomy 23, in verse 3. Deuteronomy 23 and verse 3. An, Adam, an Amorite, Ammonite, or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of Yahweh. Even to the tenth generation shall none of them enter into the assembly of Yahweh perpetually. Hmm, that sounds kind of strange. You know, would David's great-grandmother really be, you know, from, uh, uh, you know, her, her, her ethnicity be a Moabite? If a Moabite's not even allowed in the congregation ever? We look what happened, right, with, with Balaam. Remember Balaam's sin? And what was it? What was the sin that Balaam was able to catch them with? Because Yahweh would not allow Balaam to curse Israel? The Moabite women. And then when they're coming out of Mount Sinai, and Moab refuses to let them go, and Yahweh is pretty mad at Moab. Read uh, uh, Jeremiah 45. Read anything about Moab in the Bible. You know, Moab and Isaiah. Moab will be my wash part. Uh, wash pot. And there's really nothing about the redemption of Moab. So somehow, the story that we've been being told of Ruth, it really doesn't fit this. If you look at Nehemiah 13, Nehemiah the 13th chapter. In verse 1. On that day they read in the book of Moses in the ears of the people, and it was found written in it, that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of the Elohim forever, because they did not meet the sons of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. But our Elohim turned the curse into a blessing, and it happened when they had heard the Torah, they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. So we know what happened. We know in Ezra, right? When the people came in and they were marrying the foreign women, and Ezra said, no, this is what caused us the trouble. 
You have to separate. So somehow, this does not fit into the, the context of, of, of Ruth. Remember, Ruth is happening during the time of the Judges, which is going to be very important for unraveling these uh, riddles. Because uh, I'll explain in a couple of minutes, but one of the things when you start to read the Bible in Hebrew, what you find out is the Bible can be very ambiguous. You know, and the Bible can be read, and because in Hebrew, let's say, I'm just giving an example, I'm not saying that this is the way it is, but if there was 250,000 words in English, there would only be 2,500 words in Hebrew. Because in Hebrew, we know everything goes by the root, and then one root can mean many, many, many different things. So many things in Hebrew are ambiguous. So if it's ambiguous, how do we know the meaning? You know the meaning by looking at the context. You have to read the context to understand the meaning. And I think that's what we're going to see today, that the problem is in the translation of Ruth more than anything else. Uh, if we go to Deuteronomy 25, we have another problem here. Because the other part of the story is what? Ruth, you know, who because of her, the pagan Ruth who comes and gives up her pagan deity, and she comes there and falls in love with Boaz, who is the kinsman redeemer, and because of her love for this, what happens? That he decides that he is going to uh, be the kinsman for her, and they're going to go to the city gate, and they're going to do the ceremony like they do in Israel. There's only one problem with the story. That ceremony is only for Israelites. That ceremony is not for foreigners, and certainly that ceremony is not for Moabites. So how on earth, the whole reason why Yahweh made these laws, as we're going to read here, for the land covenant, so that the land would never leave the 12 tribes. So a Moabite, that if there was an Israelite that went to Moab against the word of Yahweh and married a Moabite, you know, the last guy I remember, uh, Eleazar, or, or Phineas rather, was sticking a spear in him, you know, with the two of them. So here it is, if, if, if somebody is leaving the land of Israel and going to the Moabites and marrying a Moabite woman and he happens to die, the, the, the elders of the city would never be doing this ceremony to somebody who was not an Israelite and giving over the right of the land of Judah over here to somebody that's not even Israelite. It doesn't fit. So let, let, let's read it. Deuteronomy 25, 5 and 6. If brothers live together, and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead shall not go outside to a strange man. Her brother-in-law shall go into her and take her to himself for a wife, and they shall perform the duty of the leveret. And it shall be the firstborn which she bears shall raise up for his dead brother's name of his, and his name shall not be wiped outside of Israel. The whole point is to keep the land into Israel, not to keep it to Moabite. And the last thing that's kind of strange if we look at the story the way it's portrayed to us, is that David, King David, would be one-eighth Moabite. You know, and Yeshua would be a Moabite because he's in that line the same way. Which, somehow, when you're looking at lineage, certainly doesn't seem to fit. And even when you're looking at the scripture, let's go to 2 Samuel 7, because if... Mm -hmm. 2 Samuel 8, I'm sorry. If David was a Moabite... Don't you think he would have at least a little pity? You know, some of the people out there say President Obama is really a closet Muslim. You know, and when we see the way he's acting, he tries to help the Muslims and stand up for the Muslims. You know, hey, who knows? But at least it makes sense if he's a Muslim that he's going to help other Muslims, you know, because that's what you do. You know, you try to help your own people. So even if you, uh, you like me, I was not born in Italy, but my family's from Italy. If I became king of somewhere, I certainly wouldn't start slaughtering all the Italians, you know? It wouldn't make any sense because of your background. So let's look at what happens here. In 2 Samuel 8, it happened afterwards, David struck the Philistines and humbled them. And David took the bridle of the metropolis out of the hand of the Philistines. That makes perfect sense. We know he has no connection to the Philistines. And it says, and he struck Moab. And he measured them with a line, making them to lie down on the ground. And he measured two lines to cause them to die. And one full line to keep alive. And the Moabites were slaves to David, bearers of a gift. So again, if David was one-eighth Moabite and his great-grandmother was Moabite, would he really just haphazardly just start slaughtering, okay, you two die and you're going to be my slave? It doesn't, it doesn't seem to fit. So logically, it doesn't seem to fit. And the first two points, scripturally, don't fit at all. So again, I'm not trying to bring up doubt of the Bible narrative. I'm not trying to bring up doubt of the authenticity of the Bible. I'm trying to bring up doubt 
of the translation. You know, and even our translation, uh, which mostly is right with this, we'll have to look at a couple of the things here that we may have to alter a little bit. But the, the answer that makes more sense than anything else, and what I'd like to prove to you today, which really the message is about Ruth and the two houses of Israel, is that Ruth was actually an Israelite. She was not, her ethnicity was not of a Moabite, a daughter of Moab, but literally it was where she lived, in a region that was called the fields of Moab, or the plains of Moab. But that place was not even in Moab, as we're going to see. We'll see today, unfortunately, I was hoping to have a big map on the wall. I do have small maps I'm going to show you, and we'll put them up for the screen for the brethren that will be watching this, but you could look on any Bible map and you'll see where Ruth lived was not in, in, in the country of Moab. She lived in the land of, of, of Reuben, which makes much more sense because what we're going to see is the book of Ruth, like these other books, like Song of Solomon, you know, like Jonah, this is a little pearl that Yahweh has there for the people who understand who they are and for Ephraim, and particularly in the times we're living in, because there's so much symbolism for Ephraim in the book of Ruth and maybe there's a little bit of symbolism for Gentiles, but not really nearly as much. The Gentile narrative really doesn't fit the biblical narrative. A little bit, it, over, it might overlap somewhat, but the, 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 the Ephraim narrative fits totally. So if we start here, let's go to Ruth 1.1. And it says, it happened in the days that the judges judged, it's very important, remember now, because there's a word here that's more than likely misinterpreted in the translation of most people, and it has to deal with the judges and the time of the judges, and remember, everything that Yahweh says is for a purpose, so again, he didn't have to say that it was the time that the judges judged, but he did say that, so it's going to be important as we read in the rest of this chapter. There was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem, Judah, went to live in the fields of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now, most translations incorrectly say he went to, they went to live in the country of Moab. That is totally inaccurate. If it was talking about the country, the word would be Aretz, the land. It's not the word that's used there. The word that's used there is the word Sode, Sode, which literally means to spread out. And it means field. Literally, it means field or plain field or plain, and if you look on the map, you'll see that the plains of Moab are on the other side of Jericho in the land of Reuben. So, clearly we're told here they didn't go to the Aretz of Moab, but they went to live in the fields or the plains of Moab, which is a area as a, a proof to you. Then if we go down to verse 4, and they took wives for themselves, women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the second was Ruth, and they lived there about ten years. Now, Again, when you're looking at these kind of subjects, you really got to look for clues. Because sometimes when something is ambiguous, like I said, it's the clues that are around it, and the, the connection of the root words and the things that Yahweh tells us, or sometimes the things that Yahweh doesn't tell us that make it. Now, what's interesting here is, you know, like I was saying, if uh, you lived in Oakwalaka, Florida, anybody know where Oakwalaka, Florida is? Then nobody's ever visited Cliff. Because Cliff lives in Oakwalaka, Florida. Oakwalaka, Florida, where's it named after? It's named after an Indian tribe. It was the Oakwalaka Indians. Now, I can pretty much assure you Cliff is not an Oakwalaka Indian. But I can assure you he's an Oakwalaka because he lives in Oakwalaka. <laughs> the same way of you, we, we joke, you know, about being Migdalites and whatnot. All it is is the area you live in, you know? So if it talks about a person being, uh, if they're living in the plains of Moab, you know, and they happen to be, you know, a, a, a Mulvanian because of that, because they're living in the plains of Moab, that's one thing. But the interesting part is here that Yahweh says they took for themselves women of Moab. If you look in Isaiah 16 and you look in other places of the Bible, if they were actually ethnicity Moabites, it would have said daughters of Moab. It wouldn't have said women of Moab. So he's not, he's not saying they're, they're from the, the tribe of Moab. They're not a daughter of Moab, but they live in the plains of Moab. And I'll prove to you, I'll prove to you from the scripture, that no Moabites lived in the plains of Moab. Yahweh tells us in the scripture. It's very clear when you put, 
we're going to look at the Israelites traveling and where they went and how Moab became Moab and how the Ammonites took over and how the Reubenites took over from there. And very clearly we will see that when the Reubenites took over the land of Reuben and the plains of Moab is a city in the land of Reuben, it says they killed everyone. There was not a child or a woman left. So there were no Moabites living in the plains of Moab. It's simply a name of a place. It's that simple. And that's why it says the women of Moab. It doesn't say the daughters of Moab. So, let's continue here. Let's go to Joshua. Joshua, the 13th chapter. And let's start looking at this. Because this message is kind of broken down in two parts. The first part is I want to conclusively prove to you from Scripture that Ruth, Ruth her ethnicity was a Reubenite, not a Moabite. And then the second point is I want to show you the beautiful part of this story, what it talks about, to the, the tribe of Ephraim and the return of Ephraim. But Joshua 13, and verse 15. It says, And Moses gave to the tribe of the sons of Reuben for their families. And their border was from Anar on the lip of the river Arnon, and the city which is in the middle of the valley, and all the plains of Mediba. If you remember, we were actually, when we were in Jordan, we were right there near Mediba. Heshbon, and all the cities in the tableland, Debon, and Baamoth, Baal, and Beth, Baal, Meon. So again, the land of Reuben, Reuben, what's in the land of Reuben? Heshbon, and it's on the upper part of the Anon River. And also the plains of Mediba and Baamoth Baal. Baamoth Baal is over there. If we drop down to verse 32, we'll see these are they whom Moses caused to inherit in the plains of Moab, beyond the Jordan, opposite Jericho, eastward. So right here we see that scripture is calling this land of Reuben the plains of Moab. Exactly what the book of Ruth is calling. And like I said, sometimes I'm not sure if King James does this. I think they do. They use the word country. It is not the word country. It's the word field or plain. The word, like I told you, the word sode. Sode, which literally means to spread out. Because that's what you do in the country. In the city or in the mountains, you're kind of set. But when you're in the plains, you can spread out. So I think I will show you some maps at this point, And then we'll go on so you kind of get an idea of this. The first map I'm going to show you is a Bible map, and it will show you that from the Arnon River, from the Arnon River you'll see, that's, that is where Moab starts, that's the northern border of Moab, and where Reuben's southern border, and it goes all the way to the Jabbok River, to the north, when it goes to the land of Gad there. And you'll see clearly the plains of Moab, and Eric, if you could put that in the camera and then pass it around, you'll clearly see that the plains of Moab are in the land of Reuben. Over here I have another one. It's a little, it's a little bigger that I'll show you. And the interesting part to remember in this is the story that I'm going to read you here from Scripture. Because in the story of Scripture, what it's going to show us is at one time Moab had all that area. Moab had the whole area, as we're going to see, uh, going from, from where the tribe of, of Reuben had their northern border coming all the way down to the land of Moab. And what happened? The Ammonite king came in there, and the Ammonite king took over their northern part. So what happens? When the Israelites come into the land, and Yahweh does not allow them to go into the land of Moab, you know, he says he won't allow them to do to go around it. He does allow them to go to uh, Og, the king of Bashan, and he does allow them to go into the Amorite land and take it over. So now, that's why at one time all of that was Moab. And that's why there's an area there called the Plains of Moab. But when the Amorites took it over, it continued to be called the Plains of Moab, just like Opelaka, Florida, is still called Opelaka, Florida. So when the Israelites took it over, because it was traditionally always called the Plains of Moab, it was still called the Plains of Moab, but it was not the land of Moab. So I'll give you that one. You can also put a part. And I just read to you here, right, that also there was another city that was called Bamoth Baal, Bamoth Baal, and I'll show you over here on this map the same thing. You'll see the Arnon River, which is the border to the south. You'll see Bamoth Baal in the land of Reuben, and you'll see the plains of Moab straight across, 
coming from uh, Jericho. So like I said, on, on any biblical map, this isn't something where it's hard to find. You can go on the internet, you can look these things up. If you look on a biblical map, you'll see that this is exactly the biblical narrative. So let's read a couple more scriptures on the biblical narrative, and we'll see this. Let's go to Numbers 21. Numbers, the 21st chapter. In verse 13. Numbers 21 and verse 13. Again, talking about the Israelites where they're camping. From there they pulled up stakes and camped beyond Arnon, which is in the wilderness that comes out of the border of the Amorite. For Arnon is the border of Moab between Moab and the Amorite, just like I was talking about. And if you drop down to verse 24, you'll see, And Israel struck him by the mouth of the sword, the Amorite, and seized his land from Arnon to Jabbok, exactly like you just saw on the map, to the sons of Ammon. For the border of the sons of Ammon was strong. And Israel took all these cities, and Israel dwelt in all the cities of the Amorite, in Heshbon and all the daughter villages. You see Heshbon on the map there. For Heshbon was the city of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and he had fought against the former king of Moab, and had taken his land out of his hand to Arnon. So that's what I'm saying. At one time, that was all Moab. That's why that northern area is called the plains of Moab. But the Amorite king, you know, captured half the land. And now Israelite is capturing the land from the Amorites, but Moab, the land of Moab, is still the land of Moab. But yet the plains of Moab is not in the country of Moab. It's in the land of Reuben. We drop down to verse 33. And they turned and went the way of Bashan, and Og of Bashan came out to meet him and all his people to battle at Endry. And Yahweh said to Moses, Do not fear him, for I have given him into your hand and all the people in his land, and you shall do to him as he has done to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon. And they struck him and his sons and all the people until he did not have a remnant left. And they seized his land. There's not a remnant left. Now I'm going to go to another scripture that, that even more specifically says they killed everyone. The children, the women, everybody. So let's go to Numbers 33 and verse 50. Numbers 33 and verse 50. And Yahweh spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab beside Jordan near Jericho. So Israel did not even, they didn't even go in the physical country of Moab. We know it, they went around it, yet here where Yahweh is speaking to Moses, where is it? The plains of Moab, the same word that's used for where Ruth is coming from. If we go to uh, Numbers 36 and verse 13. These are the commandments and the judgments which Yahweh commanded by the hand of Moses to the sons of Israel in the plains of Moab beside the Jordan near Jericho. So this is the very area where the tribes are together. Remember where Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh wanted to stay on that side? And Yahweh said, okay, that's, that's fine as long as they go over and fight for their brothers, and then they have to come back. And what happened there is going to be really important to this story, and we're going to read it in a little bit. Because remember, Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh, what were they afraid of? They were afraid they were going to lose their identity. That's what they were afraid of, and they built an altar there. So that's going to come into the story here of what's happening, because remember, this is before Israel's a kingdom. This is when they're ruled by judges. And that's why it's important to understand that, to understand the narrative. Uh, let's go to Numbers 21.20. I told you about the Moth. As you see it there, Numbers 21.20. And from Bamoth in the valley which is in the field of Moab, okay, the plains of Moab, the field of Moab, to the top of Pisgah and looking toward the wilderness. And on the one map I gave you, you can clearly see where Bamoth Baal is. It is clearly in the land of Reuben. It's not in the land of Moab. Uh, if we go to Deuteronomy 2, Deuteronomy 2 and verse 9. And Yahweh said to me, Do not besiege Moab, nor stir yourself up against them in battle, for I will not give their land to you for a possession, for I have given Ar as a possession to the sons of Lot. And we know that Yahweh did not allow them to go into the physical land of Moab to overtake it. If we drop down to verse 32. And Sihon, Sihon came out to meet us, 
he and all the people at battle that Jahaz. And Yahweh of Elohim delivered him before us, and we struck him and his sons and all his people. And we captured all his cities at every time, and utterly destroyed every city, men and women and little ones, everybody. We did not leave a remnant. Only we plundered the cattle for ourselves, and we took the plunder of the city. From Ar, the, the river there, which is by the edge of the Arnon River, and the city beside the river, even to Gilead. There was not a city which was too high for us. Yahweh or Elohim delivered all before us. Only you did not come near to the land of the sons of Ammon, any part of the Jabbok River. And that's what we said. Between the Arnon and the Jabbok was the land of Reuben. But clearly here, everyone's dead. So you can't even say, you know what? Okay, maybe Ruth was living in the land of Reuben as a Moabite. Because what we see here, there were no Moabites there. They killed everybody. Yahweh did not allow the Moabites, especially after what happened with, with uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Balak. Balak and Balaam. After what happened with them, there's no way that Yahweh would have allowed the Moabite women to live there. So clearly, the women, the children, everybody is dead. So there's nothing in Scripture that would even remotely make us think that, that either... Uh, Elimelech and Naomi, when they left, they went to the land of Moab instead of the land of Reuben, or that Ruth was a Moabite living in the land of Reuben. There's nothing here that would make us think either. Matter of fact, if we go to Judges 11, it's a very interesting scripture. This is with Jethro, because remember, this is the time of Ruth. This is 300 years after the period of the Judges started, and Ruth is right at the end of the period of the Judges. Because remember, you know, the, the uh, Boaz and Ruth have uh, Obed, and Obed has Jesse, and Jesse has David. And now you're in the time of the kings already. And even before that, because Saul was king for 40 years before David became king. So they're at the very end of the time of the judges. And look at what, what uh, Jethro says here. I'm going to start reading in verse 14 of Judges 11. Because who is he going to fight? The Moabites. And Jethro again sent messengers to the kings of the sons of Ammon, and he said to them, So says Jethro, Israel did not take the land of Moab and the land of the sons of Ammon. For when they came up out of Egypt, Israel went in the wilderness to the Red Sea and came in at Kadesh. So we said that. They did not take the land of Moab. They took from Og, king of Bashan, and the Amorites. And Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Please let me pass on through your land. And the king of Edom did not listen. And Israel sent also to the king of Moab, and he was not willing, and Israel remained in Kadesh. Another thing this proves is they're on the east side of the Jordan River. They're certainly not on the other side when they're coming from Mount Sinai. And he went through the wilderness and went around the land of Edom and the land of Moab and came in at the rising of the sun at the land of Moab. And they camped beyond Arnon. Now you know where that is, right? Right where they, they, they fight the Amorite and they take the land. And they did not come into the border of Moab, for Arnon was the border of Moab. And Israel sent messengers to Sihon, the king of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, Please let us pass through your land to my place. And Sihon did not trust Israel to pass on through his border. And Sihon gathered all the people, and they camped in Jahaz and fought with Israel. And Yahweh the Elohim of Israel gave Sihon and all the people into the hand of Israel, and they struck them. And Israel took possession of all the land of the Amorites and the inhabitants of the land. And they took possession of all the border of the Amorites from Arnon and to the Jabbok and from the wilderness and to the Jordan. And now Yahweh or Elohim has expelled the Amorite from before his people Israel. And would you possess it? So he's saying they're not there anymore. Only Israelites are here, not foreigners. Whatever Chemosh your God causes you to possess, do you not possess it? And all which Yahweh our Elohim has expelled before us we will possess. And now, are you at all any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab? And striving, he did not strive with Israel. Did he ever fight against them? When Israel lived in Heshbon and its towns, and in Aor and its towns, and all the cities on this side of the Arnon, for 300 years, then why have you not delivered them in that time? So he's, he's, he's taunting him, and saying, look, Yahweh gave this to us. The Israelites have controlled this area for the last 300 years. Why should we give it up to you? Which is clear proof here. This is the time of Ruth. And who's living here? Israelites. Reubenites are living here. Not, not Moabites. So like I said, when you look at the history, it's very clear. Moab had all the land. 
The Amorite came in, took half of it, but the plains of Moab was now in the land of the Amorites. Israel comes in, takes over the land of the Amorites. The land where the plains of Moab was was the land of Reuben. And what we're told is all the outsiders, all the Moabites that lived there, or all the Amorites were killed, and only Israelites lived there. That's the biblical narrative, nothing else. So now, why on earth would we believe when clearly, clearly, Elimelech, you know, and Naomi, that seem to be good, upstanding, you know, citizens from the tribe of Judah, when they're going over to the plains of Moab, why would we think they're down in, in the country of Moab? When it's not the country of Moab. It makes no sense whatsoever. So, like I said, what I want to show is that Ruth was the same as Naomi. They were both Israelites. One was from Judah, though. One was from Reuben. Another thing that's interesting is Ruth is not a uh, Gentile name. It's a Hebrew name, the name Ruth. It literally means friend and companion. And it comes from the same root word as Ra'a, shepherd. Which is interesting because David was a shepherd, as we know Yeshua was a shepherd. But let's go to Ruth 1 in verse 15. And let's start looking at some of the narrative, why people misinterpret that Ruth was actually a Gentile instead of an Israelite. And like I said, remember, we're at the time of the judges. Now this is at the point in Ruth 1 where Naomi is telling Ruth and her sister to go back. You know, what, what am I going to do for you? I'm, even if I had a child, you're going to wait 20 or 30 years until they grow up. And I'll start in verse 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has turned back to her people and to her, quote-unquote, gods, is the way they usually put it, her Elohim. You turn back after your sister-in-law. Now, again, in the English, it's going to come out one way, but in the Hebrew, it comes out another way. Because he said, turn back to your people. The word used here is am, am, which literally is tribe, if you look it up. So she's saying, look, what are you going to do here in Judah with us? Go back to your tribe. And interesting enough, she says, go back to your Elohim. What did we read in verse 1? And it happened in the days that the judges judged. You know, Elohim, most of the time in the Bible, is used, we know, for Yahweh. But sometimes the word Elohim is used for a judge. So we're in the time of the judges. We see that he even says this. We're in the time the judges judge because it's important to the story to understand this. See, if you're already in the time of the king, because remember, this is a time where there is no king in Israel. But it's a time where the ones who are coming back are anticipating the kinsman redeemer. So it's important to the restoration of Ephraim to understand about this. So this is what Naomi's telling her. She's saying, go back to your tribe and go back to your judges. Each one had their own. If you go to 1 Samuel 2 and verse 25, I'll show you a, a situation here where Elohim is used for judge. It says, if a man sins against a man, then the judge shall judge him. But if a man sins against Yahweh, who shall pray for him? If a man sins against a man, then the judge will judge him. And the word used here is Elohim for judge. If a man sins against a man, then the judge and it's, the word is used there, will judge him. But if a man sins against Yahweh, who will pray for him? So we see, it's not very often, but at times, because Elohim, you know, means mighty one, sometimes the word Elohim is used for judge. And if there is a part where it would be used for judge, it would make total sense that it's used here at the time when the judges are judging. Now comes the real important verse, though. The real important verse. And it's Ruth 1 and 16. And like I said, I'm going to read, first of all, Joshua 22 and verse 27, 28. Because it's important to understand at the time of the judges, you know, even way before this time, in the very beginning, what happened? We know that the, the two and a half tribes on the other side of the Jordan, they built an altar there. And when they built that altar, what happened? The other tribes said, we're going to go to war against them. They're, they're building an altar. They, they shouldn't be building an altar there. You can only build an altar, you know, at the tabernacle of Yahweh. And what did they do? They came back and said, far be it. We're not building an altar for sacrifice. We're building an altar because you know what's going to happen? You're going to die, and we're going to die, and then we're going to have children, and they're going to have children. And then they're going to say, look, there's a river between us. There's a natural border. You know? And maybe they're not going to accept us anymore as Israelites. And I'll read over here, Joshua 2, 27. But let 
But it shall be the, the, the altar of their building. It shall be a witness between us and you and between our generation after us to do the service of Yahweh before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifice and, and with our peace offerings. That your sons may not say to our sons in the future, you have no portion in Yahweh. And we said it shall be when they say this to us in our generations hereafter, that we may say, see the pattern of the altar of Yahweh, which our fathers made, not for burnt offering, but for sacrifice, for a testimony that it is between you and me. So do you understand the ramifications here? The ramifications are that Orpah, you know, Ruth is, uh, that Naomi is saying, hey, go back to your tribe, because there's nothing here for you. And she's going back to her tribe and back to her judges. And you have 12 separate people. You don't have one nation of Israel. You have 12 separate people being judged by different judges. But Ruth now is going to say something totally different. And listen what she says now. And Ruth said, Do not beg me to leave you, to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Now the way it's interpreted is, your people shall be my people, and your Elohim, my Elohim. There's only one problem with that interpretation. The word shall be is not there. Look at the concordance, look at the original, look at the Masoretic text. The word shall be is not there. They add the word shall be because they're thinking that Ruth is a Gentile. So let's just read it for what is there, without adding anything to it. So Ruth sees that Naomi is sending her sister back to the tribe of Reuben, and back to the judges there. And Ruth says, do not beg me to leave. To turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people are my people. And your Elohim, my Elohim. That's exactly the way it says it. Your people are my people. Your Elohim. See, you see that altar there? Don't you remember 300 years ago why we built it? We're one. We're one people. We're one people. The only problem is, it's kind of hard to be one people when you're living in 12 different lands with 12 different judges. And that's why the Kinsman Redeemer, the only book that the Kinsman Redeemer is in is in Ruth. And it makes total sense to the uniting again of Israel. But only if you understand who Ruth is. You've got to understand who Ruth is. Now here's another thing that's very interesting with this. If you go to Ruth 2.20, look what she says. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed is he of Yahweh, who has not forsaken his kindness with the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is near of kin to us. She's talking about Boaz. If Ruth was a Gentile, she would never say, He is near of kin to us. She would say, He's near of kin to me. Remember, her son wasn't even alive at this time. You know? So she would never say that. But he's saying he's near of kin to us. Because they're coming from the same people. And that's the biggest story of the book. It's not a Gentile joining themselves to the house of Yahweh. The biggest story of the book is that all the tribes are one. There's one kinsman redeemer and all the tribes are one. In Ruth 3, in verse 1, and her mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter, do I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? And now, is not Boaz of our kindred? Is not Boaz of our kindred? So we clearly see that both Ruth and Israel are if both Ruth and Naomi were Israelites. So like I said, the basis of the story is, and this is what I want to get into in the rest of the message, is really showing what the, really st the real story is about. The two house symbolism as a story of a hidden jewel of Messiah and his pride, the two houses of Israel. About Ephraim's lost identity and now coming back home through Judah and through the Messiah. So this book... And here it is, you know, for Yahweh to bring this out on this Shavuot, you know, of all times, I think is so fitting for the times we're living in. Because literally, Ruth is being fulfilled before our eyes and within the life of some of you that are sitting here today. So let's go back to Ruth 1. And now the rest of the message, I really want to show the Ephraimite connection to the book of Ruth. Ruth 1 in verse 14. So now that you understand where Ruth is coming from, you understand what her real motives are, now you can understand the message. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has turned back to her tribe and turned back to her judges. You turn back after your sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Do not beg me to leave you, to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. 
Because your people are my people, and your Elohim is my Elohim. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May Yahweh do to be and more so, if anything but death, part you and me. So here's a time where so many are turning back, right? You know? It's hard to get people to come out of the world. It's hard to get people to come out of Babylon. And yet, there are a few roots. A few roots in this room. A few roots out there in the congregations that want to do what they love, the nation of Israel. They love our brother Judah. They want to come here. You know, and they know, we know we're not Jewish. The same way Ruth knew she wasn't Jewish. But she's saying, look, we're all from the same tribe. Your people are my people. And your Elohim is my Elohim. And she wanted to cling to her because she knew salvation is of the Jews. The same way we know. Why are we coming here? Why do we want to come to Israel? Because Yahweh is redeeming this nation in the end time. And we read it today. Where is Yahweh in the end time? Yahweh is in Mount Zion. And salvation will be in Mount Zion. And this is where everything that Yahweh is doing. So what do we want to do? We want to cling to our brother Judah. And we want to be part of it. We want to be accepted because we're, we're one. We're the same people. But there's a lot more to the story than that. Galatians 3 and verse 29. And if you are of Messiah, then you are seeds of Abraham, even heirs according to the promise. If you are seeds of Messiah, then you are... If you are of Messiah, then you are seeds of Abraham and heir according to the promise. Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Uh, I'm sorry, Romans, the 10th chapter. Or 15th chapter. Romans 15. In verse 8. And I say, Yeshua Messiah has become a minister of circumcision for the truth of Elohim to confirm the promises of the fathers and for the nations to glorify Yahweh for mercy, even as it has been written. Because of this, I will confess you in the nations and I will give praise to your name. And again, he says, rejoice nations with his people. And again, praise the master Yahweh, all the nations, and praise him, all the people. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse shall be, and he rising up to rule the nations on him nations will hope. And may the Elohim of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, for you to abound in hope in power of the Holy Spirit. And like I said, before 1948, if we read these hundred scriptures that I read in that message last week, I've read them in many messages, about the restoration of the nation of Israel, 95% of the people would say that's spiritual. That means the church. The church is being built up. But our hope on these scriptures being real is the fact that Israel is a nation again. That after 2,520 years of being in diaspora, being nowhere, being in the history books, that the words of the history books are coming off the pages and Israel is a nation again. And that's what Ruth saw. She saw that, okay, my people are here and they're Israelites, but they're on the other side of the river. We got to come home. We gotta come home. I wanna be part of it. I wanna be part of Judah. I wanna be part of what's going on. And I don't wanna be separated. I don't wanna be separated by a river anymore. I don't wanna be separated by anything. And that's what we see here in Romans, this, this chapter. That how he's saying, you know, the hope in the nations, that for every single Ephraimite that knows who they are around the world, and there's millions upon millions of them, the fact that Judah is here, and the fact that Yahweh has blessed them for 65 years and miraculously kept them a nation again and fulfilled his word, gives us hope that we're coming, that we're ready, that we're ready to come home, and his kingdom is ready to come. Let's go back to Ruth 1. And verse 19, because now the symbolism starts falling off the pages everywhere. And they went, both of them, until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened as they came into Bethlehem and all the city was moved at them and they said, is this Naomi? So where, where are they from? Bethlehem? Where does the Messiah come from? Micah 5 and verse 2. Micah 5 and verse 2. And you, Bethlehem Ephrata, being least among the thousands of Judah, out of you 
He shall come forth to me, being ruling one in Israel, and is going forth to been from old from the days of eternity. So now we clearly see that the story is one of redemption. The story is one, like I said, although the kinsman redeemer is mentioned sporadically here and there, there is no other book in the Bible where the whole book is centered around the kinsman redeemer. You know, not even explaining it through the book of Ruth. As a matter of fact, like I say, if you take the book of Hebrews out of the Bible, you have a gaping hole in the Melchizedek uh, priesthood. In the same way here, you take out the book of Ruth out of the scripture, and you've got a gaping hole in the whole story of the kinsman redeemer. Of what he does, of how he does it, of how it comes into play. Now you have a gaping hole. So we see that Boaz is a type of Messiah in here. And where are they coming from? They're coming from Bethlehem, the very place that it says that the Messiah comes from. What is the time of the year? The barley harvest, right? The time of the barley harvest. And we know that Yeshua is the wave sheaf. He is the first fruit. And what are we doing? Why are, why are they reading this on Shavuot? Because Shavuot is the fruition of it. Because you can't have Shavuot unless you have Pesach. You know, or actually first fruits. You have to have the, the Feast of First Fruits to have Shavuot. And you can't have Feast of First Fruits unless you have Pesach. So you've got to get it in the right order. But here it is, and that's why you have to count. And that's why what Yeshua was saying after 40 days when he's ascended up to heaven, what did he say? Wait in Jerusalem until the fullness of Shavuot comes. Wait in Jerusalem until the fullness of of Shavuot comes. John 20 and verse 16. John 20 and verse 16. Yeshua said there, this is when Mary Magdalene sees him, when he's first resurrected. Yeshua said to her, Miriam, turning around, she said to him, Rabboni, that is to say, my great one. Yeshua said to him, do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my Elohim and your Elohim. What did, Naomi, what did uh, Ruth say to Naomi? We are one. Your Elohim is my Elohim. And I, I love coming here to Jerusalem every day of my life. I love coming here for the feasts. But I think as an Ephraimite, there's no greater feast to be here than Shavuot. Because this is really where our hope of being just like them. You know, what do we want? We only want what our brothers have. We want a little piece of land. We want to live here. We want to start cultivating our fields. We want to raise our children. We want to play with them in the streets with our brothers. That's all we want. We just want to come home. And this feast gives us such hope. To come home. It gives us this hope because Judah is already here. But as we're going to see from this story, <laughs> they're not exactly ready to mar their inheritance. And that's what the problem is. But it's not going to matter because we have a kinsman redeemer who will bring us home. So Yeshua, one of the greatest scriptures here, tell them, I'm going to my father and your father, my Elohim and your Elohim. We've got to have the Feast of First Fruits in order to have Shabbat. And here it is, the whole story is taking place during the morning harvest. Exactly the same time. Let's go to Ruth 2. In verse 1. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man, a mighty man of the family of Elimelech. And his name was Boaz. His name was Boaz. So... Here it is. I mean, like I said, take Ruth out of the Bible, show me another story where somebody in Israel is being redeemed by the kinsmen, and it's all, the whole focus is on this kinsman. You don't see it. You know, you see it in, 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 in uh, Leviticus 25, in the year of release, the kinsman is the one, so we understand the concept, but we never really see it in practicality, except for here in some, some scriptures that talk about Yahweh being our kinsman redeemer. But here we see it in practicality because... Boaz is playing the role of the Messiah. He is the kinsman. You know, there's a kinsman of our family, and what does the kinsman do? Like I said, I'm not going to go to Leviticus 25 and read it, but we know that when somebody got themselves enslaved, and they couldn't, you know, care for themselves anymore, and they lost everything they had, and they lost their land. And like I said, the kingdom of Yahweh, kingdom, where does it come from? King's domain. There is no kingdom without property. 
Kingdom has to do with real estate. It's not just a nice fuzzy feeling that you get in your tummy. It is a real land with real real estate. There's a real king and there's real allotment of land. So here it is. There's a kinsman redeemer here. There's somebody that has the authority to give back what was lost. And like I said, every one of us, when you look under Leviticus 25, every one of us fall under that because each of us have committed sins that we can't repay. If without a kinsman redeemer, we are all in trouble because none of us can redeem himself in the Jubilee. And that's why we so much anticipate for the kinsman redeemer to come in the day of the Jubilee and redeem back to us what was lost. What was lost through Adam, you know, through the sin in the Garden of Eden, and what was lost through our ancestors, the children of Israel. You know, when they defied Yahweh, and they broke his commandments, and they went into diaspora, into the nations. So Boaz is the kinsman redeemer. He's playing the, the, the role of the Messiah in this story. And if we drop down to verse 8. And Boaz said to Ruth, do not hear. Do you not hear, my daughter? Do not go to glean in another field, and also do not pass through this. And you shall stay close to my young women. Your eyes shall be on the field which they shall reap, and you shall go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? When you are thirsty, then you shall go to the vessels and shall drink from that which the young men draw. So here it is. What is he telling her? What was the big lesson we learned at the school last year? Don't leave the camp. Don't leave the camp because when you're in the camp, you're protected by the kinsman redeemer. You go outside the camp, you get yourself in trouble. And he's saying, as long as you're here, as long as you're in these four walls, as long as you're within the confines of the kinsman redeemer, you're going to be protected. But when you leave the camp, you know, you're in trouble. You're on your own. And then let's look at what Ruth's reaction is to him. I'll read verse 10. And she fell on her face and bowed to the earth and said to him, Why have I found grace in your eyes that you should notice me? And I am a stranger. You know, why have I found grace in your eyes that you should notice me? And I am a stranger. You know, it's the same way that we feel through Yeshua. You know, the fact that uh, when you look at our brother Judah, who never lost their identity, you know, for the last 2,500 years, although they were not here in the land of Israel, they kept themselves separated. Even today, you can go to Syria. There's still uh, not many, but there's hundreds of Jews that live in certain areas in Syria, in Egypt, even Iran. There's a community of, of Jews living in Iran, and they know who they are. They didn't lose their identity all around the world because they kept the sanctity. For Ephraim, that didn't happen to us. So basically, what happened? When Ephraim got cast into the nations, you know, between 734 and 718 B.C., you know, under Sennacherib, uh, the king of Assyria, you know, and uh, Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, Ephraim lost his identity. He lost who he was. So in the end time, it's great to study it and understand it and say, wow, now I really know my lineage. But what good is it without the land? What good is it without identity? And this is where not only today, but in the days of Yeshua, this is the way the Ephraimites were. You know, you read Josephus. There's no such thing as the lost tribes of Israel. They were never lost. In the days of Josephus, he says exactly where they were. And many, many thousands used to come to Israel for the feast. You know where they used to go? They used to go into the court of the Gentiles. Because the same way that if you read scripture and it says, so-and-so shall not come into the congregation until the fourth generation or to the tenth generation, the rabbis had figured, look, you've been out of this land for 18 generations. With that being the fact, even though we know who you are, we know you're from Reuben or you're from this, we don't consider you Israelite anymore. You've been out of the land too long. You're not living here. So they did not consider them Israelites. And when they came, they literally had to stay in the court of the Gentiles. Let's go to Ephesians 2. I want to show you this because it's an extremely important point to this story. Because not only is the kinsman redeemer giving back land that belonged, but the kinsman redeemer is giving back what? He's giving back identity. He's giving back identity. Because remember, Ruth's husband, you know, his first child now, he has to build up seed for the dead one. 
He's got to bring the identity back. Without that, that would be the end of it. You know, those would just be two, two people that we remember that died. But he's bringing back the identity of who they were. So if we go to Ephesians 2, in verse 11, and think how you would have felt if you were an Israelite living in the first century. And you really, you had no hope. Because even your own people didn't accept you who you were. And now all of a sudden the Messiah comes. And through the Messiah now, that wall, there was a wall in the temple that separated the court of Israel and the court of the Gentiles. That literally that wall was broken down because now there was no separation anymore. And whether you were Jew or whether you were from one of the other ten tribes, it made no difference. That Yeshua came for all the tribes of Israel. He came to redeem the whole house of Israel. And as far as the believers went, there was no separation. You don't see anywhere in the New Covenant, wherever it says that someone has supremacy because they're Jewish, compared to if they're a Reubenite or a Gadite, or even if you're a Gentile who grafted yourself in. It doesn't make a difference. We read it in, in Galatians 3.29. Because once you come to Messiah, you become a seed of Abraham and an heir according to the promise. So think how you would have felt if you're living in Babylon or living in Egypt or living in Syria or living in one of these areas and hoping and hoping and waiting. And now the Messiah comes and he redeems you back in the covenant relationship. Ephesians 2 and verse 11. Because of this, remember that you, the nations, were then in the flesh from the beginning, and you were called uncircumcision. So they're literally called Gentile, uncircumcision. Different from those called circumcision, which is the work of the hands of the flesh. That at that time, you were without the Messiah. Now he's talking to Ephraimites. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers of the covenants of promise, having no hope and without no aim in the world. But now, in Messiah Yeshua, you who then were afar off are brought near by the blood of Messiah. For he is our peace, who has made both one, Ikad, and has broken down the wall of separation between them. Literally the wall like we talked about. In his flesh he has caused to cause the enmity due to the man-made regulations. It was the rabbis who made these laws, not the Torah. That he might himself create two into one man making peace. Ezekiel 37. The two sticks. One is for Judah and his companions, the sons of Israel, and one is for Ephraim and his companions, the tribes of Israel. And he reconciled both in one body to Elohim and destroyed the enmity through the crucifixion. In coming, he proclaimed peace to you, the ones afar off, and to the ones near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father, so that you are no longer strangers and family members living abroad, but you are natives of the same family of the saints and children of the family of Yahweh. And this is the clear part. When you look at this in both the Greek and the Aramaic, the words that are used, you are no longer strangers and family members living abroad. They would never use that word for a Gentile. They would never use that word for a Jew. It would only be used for an Israelite living in diaspora. That's the only people that this word would be used for. Being built up on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Yeshua Messiah himself being the cornerstone of the building. And whom all the building being fitted together grows into a, a, a holy sanctuary in Yahweh. And whom you are also being built together into a dwelling place of Elohim in the Spirit. So very, very clearly we see what the book of Ruth is about. It's about the kinsman redeemer taking the two sticks, putting them into one. Redeeming Ephraim back into covenant relationship. If we go back to Ruth 2, 11 and 12. And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully revealed to me all that you have done with your mother-in-law after the death of her husband. And you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and came to a people which you had not known before. May Yahweh repay your work and your wages shall be complete from Yahweh the Elohim of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. You know, it's, it's interesting, but when I read... This scripture here, I think of some of the people in this room. Because you did the exact same thing. You left your home, you left your family, you left your, your, your fatherland of birth, at least anyway. And you came to a people that you didn't know to serve them. And I know for each of you, you've had them say to you, why are you doing this? Why would you be here? Why would you be serving us this way? And I believe that this is part of the fulfillment of this prophecy. Because it's exactly what we're doing. And... 
in, in 2009, when we had the big Shabbat celebration, welcome home Ephraim. That was exactly what Yahweh showed me at that time. That Ephraim would not be coming back here, you know, waving banners and yelling at Judah and saying, this is our land too. That the ones that Yahweh would allow to come back here would be people with a servant's heart. And that's why, what is the son's name that Ruth and Boaz have? Obed. Obed, Obed means work, <laughs> you know? You're coming here to work. It's servant. You're coming here to serve. We're not coming here to shove anything down Judah's throat. Yahweh will take care of Judah, and Yeshua will take care of them when the time is right. We're coming here to serve. We're coming here to serve. And this is exactly what Boaz says, the kinsman redeemer. You know, the message that comes to us. I've seen what you're doing. I've seen it. And I appreciate it. And you know what? Because of what you're doing for your mother-in-law, for our sister, for Judah, I will not forget you. And that is a promise to us, and it's a promise to everyone out there that hasn't gotten here yet. And I say, you know, the door that Yahweh has opened now, I don't know how long it will be open. You know, it could close tomorrow, and then people will be saying, oh, well, you know, I, I've come. The door is open now. If people want to come, you want to serve? You want to serve Yahweh? You want to come and serve Judah? The door is open. The visas are there, and people can come. You know, they need us. You want to help handicapped? You want to help people that can't help themselves? You want to be an Ovet? You want to be a servant? Then come here and do it. Because you people are fulfilling the scripture. You're fulfilling the scripture. This is the beautiful story of Ruth. That the kinsman redeemer, would touched his heart, was that this lady had a people. She was a Reubenite, and she could have went back to her land and back to her judges. And she said no. She said, look, you're back in the land, and I'm going to stay here. We are one, and your people are my people. My Elohim is your Elohim. And that's what we're doing. We're here to stand up with Judah. And I told this story before, but it touches my heart, because when we first got here, at least for me and Petra, Judah didn't understand this. And neighbors of ours for years that would not even say hello. Every day we'd say hello, and they'd walk by and not say a word to us. And when the war happened in 2006... We were in the United States at the time. The first thing we did was get our ticket come back. And we found out half our kibbutz and went to the south. The people that were there said, what are you doing? Don't you know there's war? <laughs> what are you doing here? And I told them. I said, you're our neighbors. We're coming back to stand with you. And I said, if we stand with you today in war, then I want to have a glass of wine with you during peace. And ever since that day, they were totally different to us. You know, they saw that we cared about them. They saw that we had no hidden motives. We're not here to change them. We're here to love them. We're here to serve them. We're here to be an Obed. We're here to be, to be a servant. You know, we're here to work. Like it says in Daniel 11, in that day the people who know their Elohim will work. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to work. And we're here to see the wonderful fulfillment that Yahweh has through this beautiful story. Let's go to verse 20. And Naomi said to her, the Lord, Blessed is he of Yahweh who has not forsaken his kindness with the living and with the dead. And Naomi said to her, The man is near of kin to us. He is our kinsman's redeemer. And Ruth of Moab said, And he surely said to me, You shall stay close, near to the young men whom I have, until they have completed the whole harvest which I have. You know? What is Yeshua doing now? You know? The, the, the harvest is white. The work, workers, uh, the harvest is ready, but the workers are few. And he's saying that... We need to stay close to the trunk of the tree until he's completed the whole harvest in which he has. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Ruth, Good, my daughter, that you go out with his young woman, and that men may not attack you in another field. And she stayed close to the young woman of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. So like we said, stay close to the trunk of the tree. If you go out away from your covering, you get yourself in trouble. But beautiful, beautiful story of redemption of Ephraimite being grafted back into his own tree. If we go to Romans 11, we see the same thing. We see the prophecy of Ephraim being grafted back in his own tree. Romans 11, 1 through 5. I say that did not Israel thrust away his, or did not Elohim thrust away his people? Let it not be. For I am an Israelite out of Abraham's seed of the tribe of Benjamin, the sea apostle Paul speaking. Elohim did not thrust away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in Elijah? 
How he pleaded with Elohim against Israel, saying, Yahweh, they killed your prophets and they dug down your altars, and only I am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine answer say to him? I reserve to myself 7,000 men who did not bow the knee to Baal. Even so, in this present time, a remnant is preserved, elected by grace, and is coming to be. This is what Yahweh has. All around the world we know there is a remnant that he is calling and waking up by his spirit and bringing back into the knowledge of who they are. We drop down to verse 12. Now, if they're slipping away, talking about the tribes, is the riches of the world and their condemnation the riches of the nations, how much more their restoration? For I speak to you, the nations, since I am an apostle of the nations. I glorify my ministry. If somehow I may provoke to jealousy my flesh and may save some of them. For if their casting away is the reconciliation of the world, right? By Ephraim being cast into the nations, what did that do? It opened salvation for the world? Because when Yeshua came, what did he tell the apostles? Don't go to the way of the Gentiles, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. If they were all here in the land, it would have never left these four boundaries of Israel. But since Ephraim went all over the world, now the apostles had to go all over the world looking for them. For if their casting away is reconciliation of the world, what will be their, be their restoration except life from the dead? So the casting away of Israel opened up salvation to all nations, because as you're going and looking for Israelites, anybody, any Gentile of any race or any country can join in. Yahweh is not a respected person. But now, it's been 2,700 years since Israel has understood their identity. And only in this end of this generation, only in the last 10, 20, 30 years, has Ephraim really understood who he is. He says if their casting away was for the good news for the world, what is their restoration except life from the dead? The resurrection. So we see the time we're living in. Now if the first fruit is holy, so is the love. If the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and became a share of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, it is not that you bear the root, but the root bears you. You will say that the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, for unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be high-minded, but fear. For if Elohim did not spare the natural branches, fear that it may be he will not spare you either. So we don't take our calling high-mindedly. We don't look down on Judah and say, oh, they don't accept the Messiah. No. We understand. We only, ex we only accept the Messiah by Yahweh's grace, and they'll accept him when it's given. Behold, then, the kindness and severity of Elohim. On those having fallen severity, but on you kindness, if you continue in the kindness, otherwise you will be cut off. And those also, if they do not continue in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For Elohim is able to graft them in again, and we know it. We know Zechariah as well. They will look upon me and they pierce. We know it. For if you were cut out of the natural wild olive tree, and against nature were grafted into a good olive tree, how much more these being according to nature will be grafted into their own tree? Like we said, the olive tree is a very interesting tree, because you can cut off a branch, you could stick it in the ground, and you can make a new tree. The ones in the, the Garden of Gethsemane, some of them are 1,800 years old, and the branches that started that tree are more than 2,000 years old. But you can't take the branch that's stuck and try to stick it back in the tree. You can't tape it. You know, there's people that think tape solves everything. Solves most things, but not everything. You can't tape the branch back on. It's not going to work. And that's what he's saying. For I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be wise within yourself, that hardness and part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the nations come in. We know from Genesis that Ephraim is the fullness of the nations. Genesis 48, 8 through 19. And so all the tribes of Israel will be saved, even as it has been written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away iniquity from Jacob. So here it is. This is all part of the book of Ruth. It's all about the redemption of Ephraim. It's all about Ephraim humbling himself before Yahweh not coming with bold eyes and and this is my land, and the way that some of these people, they come here to the land today, and it would only cause this trouble for us, and cause this trouble for our brother Judah. But it's about us coming here with a servant attitude. It's about us loving our brother, even in their 
their, their denial, the same way Yahweh loved us in our denial. And it's about serving them. And showing Yahweh that we, 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 we have that, that heart and that mind that he has. Like in the book of Ruth. The same way that Ruth, who was representative of Ephraim, would not go back to her people, but joined herself to Judah in order to serve and to, to care for her. So let's go back to Ruth, finish this up. Ruth, third chapter now. And her mother-in-law Naomi said to her, My daughter, I do not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you. And now is not Boaz of our kindred with those whose young woman you have been? Behold, he is winnowing the threshing floor of barley tonight. And you shall bathe and anoint yourself and put your garments on you, the new wedding garments, right, like it talks about in Revelation, and go down to the threshing floor. Do not let yourself be known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lies down, you shall know the place where he lies down, and you shall go in and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what you are to do. And she said to her, All that you say I will do. And she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law commanded her. And Boaz ate and drank, and his heart felt good, and he went to lie down at the end of the heap. And he came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. And it happened in the middle of the night that the man trembled and turned himself, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? And she said, I am your handmaid, Ruth, and you shall spread your skirt over your handmaid, for you are a kinsman redeemer. Now it's interesting, if you look at Revelation 7 and verse 15, we see from those coming out of great tribulation, you know, uh, read verse 14, and I said to him, sir, you know, and he said to me, these are those coming out of great affliction, and they washed their robes and whitened them in the blood of the Lamb. The same as Ruth is going with her new clothing before Boaz. Because of this, they are before the throne of Yahweh and serve him day and night in the sanctuary. And he sitting on the throne will tabernacle over them. If you look at King James and some of the other translations, they literally say he will put his skirt over them. Because it was a, a, uh, an idiom, meaningly, he's going to be their covering. He's going to tabernacle. He's going to put his skirt over them. So going back to Ruth. Verse 10, uh, chapter 3. And he said, Blessed be you of Yahweh, my daughter. You have dealt more kindly at the latter end than the beginning. The early reign and the latter reign. Not to go after the young man or the rich or the poor. And now, my daughter, do not fear all that you say I will do to you. For all the gate of my people know that you are a woman of virtue. What does Revelation 14, 4 and 5 say? Revelation 14, 4 and 5. These are the ones who, became, who were not defiled, for they are pure. These are the ones following the Lamb wherever He may go. These are redeemed from among men, being the first fruits to Yahweh and the Lamb. And no decoy was found in their mouth, for they are unmarked before the throne of Yahweh. So that's what we see here. She is a woman of virtue. She's a woman of purity, just like the ones who follow the Lamb wherever they go. Now, this is so, so much here, uh, talking about Ephraim's redemption in the end time. But I find it interesting, too, all the symbolism that you find here. Where does it take place? Out of all places, the threshing floor. You know, the threshing floor. Why a threshing floor? You know, I mean, it could have been any other place on earth, but there's so much symbolism to why it takes place on the threshing floor. Let's go to 2 Samuel 24. In verse 16, 2 Samuel 24, verse 16. And this is with David, remember, when the messenger of Yahweh was destroying the people because of what David did. And the messenger of Yahweh put forth his hand to Jerusalem to destroy it. And Yahweh had pity as to the evil and said to the messenger who was destroying among the people, Enough, drop your hand. And the messenger of Yahweh was near the threshing floor of Aronah the Jeshurun. And when he saw the messenger was striking among the people, David spoke to Yahweh and said, Behold, I have sinned. Yea, I have acted perversely. And these the flock, what have they done? Now let your hand be on me and on my father's house. And God came into David on that day and said, Go up, raise up an altar to Yahweh in the threshing floor of Arunah the Jeshurun. 
So we see that everything happens on the, the threshing floor. The threshing floor is the place of redemption. It's the place of redemption. It's the place where Yeshua says he has a lineal fork in his hand and he's separating now the wheat and the chaff. That happens on the threshing floor. And it's the place of redemption. It's the place of redemption. And that's why Ruth is coming there, symbolizing, you know, Ephraim at this time, coming back in virtue and humility. That's why she's coming at his feet. She's coming in a humble position, a humble attitude. And he's respecting that. He's respecting the fact that she's coming this way, that she's coming as a servant, that she's not looking for her own, but she's coming to redeem her people. And it all happens where the wheat is separated from the chaff. So let's go to Ruth 4. We ended up here. Because now what happens? Now Boaz accepts it. You know, the kinsman redeemer, the same way when we come humbly to Yeshua, as the true kinsman redeemer, he accepts it. But he says there's one slight problem here. There's a kinsman who is closer at this point to take care of them in the flesh. So Boaz went up to the gate and sat there. Chapter 4, verse 1. And behold, the near kinsman of whom Boaz had spoken was passing by. And he said, Such a one turn aside, sit down. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down. And they come in. How many tribes of Israel are there? Ten. And he said to the near kinsman, Naomi, who has returned from the fields of Moab, will sow a portion of the field which belonged to our brother to Elimelech. And I said, I would uncover your ear saying, buy it before those sitting and before the elders of the people. If you will redeem, redeem. But if you will not redeem, tell me so that I may know. From there is no one beside you to redeem, and I after you. And he said, I will redeem it. And Boaz said, in the day you buy the field from Naomi's hand, even you have bought from Ruth of Moab, the, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of him who died over his inheritance. And the near kinsman said, I am not able to redeem for myself, that I not ruin my own inheritance. You redeem for yourself my right of redemption, for I am not able to redeem. So we learn from this. There is only one qualified kinsman redeemer. But what happens? Some of the Ephraimites, they don't want to wait on Yahweh. They want to come, and they want to go to the first kinsman redeemer. They want to, they want to come to Judah, and they want to convert to Judaism. Is, Jude, is, is our brother Judah opening up the door for us? Absolutely not. Why not? Because we read it here. They don't want to mar their own inheritance. And, you know, we see it now. Each war that's happened, Judah has, has been attacked by their neighbors to be taken land. And every war, Judah took more land. So Judah isn't looking for it. This, this man didn't come looking for Boaz. Boaz came looking for him. But when he had the opportunity, he said, absolutely, I'll take the land. But if it was a matter of accepting... Ruth, accepting Ephraim, they didn't want to do it. They felt it would more his inheritance. But it's all part of the plan. Because like I said, Judah is not our Redeemer. Our Redeemer is Yeshua. You know? Ephraim is the firstborn, and Yeshua is our Redeemer. So let's go to verse 7. We end it up here. And this formerly was done in Israel for redemption, and as far as exchange to confirm every matter. A man would draw off his sandal. What were we just talking about, right? With Gilgal? The sandal, what does sandal show? A sandal shows permeance in the land. Sandal shows Yahweh's blessing. Sandal shows everywhere your foot goes will be yours. So he drew off his sandal and gave it to his neighbor, and this was the attestation in Israel. And the near kinsman said to Boaz, buy for yourself. And he drew off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have bought all that belonged to Elimelech, and all that was Chilean and Mahon, and from the hand of Naomi. And also Ruth of Moab, the wife of Mahom, I have bought for myself for a wife to raise up the name of him who died over his inheritance. Who is that? And that is every single Ephraimite. That is every tribe. Because we have no inheritance anymore. You know, we may know where our family comes from. And we may know from 20 generations back that we might be connected with an Israelite tribe. But in reality, we're nothing. We're nothing. We have no legal rights to anything, you know, without the kinsman redeemer. And this is why he's raising up the name of him who died over his inheritance. And that's why every one of us are buried with him in baptism. Because we die to the old self in the baptism. 
And we're not coming up, and we're not claiming inheritance here because I'm from the tribe of Dan or Gad or Reuben. We're claiming inheritance because we're believers in Messiah. That's what gives us the inheritance. So he's raising up the name of him who died over his inheritance. And the name of him who died shall not be cut off from among his brothers. And from the gate of his place, your witnesses today. Like we said, Ezekiel 37, the Messiah takes the one stick for Judah and his companions, the one stick for Ephraim and his companions, and he makes them into one. And all 12 tribes will be saved. And the people who were in the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May Yahweh make the woman who is coming into your house to be as Rachel and as Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you do worthily in Ephrata and proclaim the name in Bethlehem. And let your house be as the house of Pharis, who to more bore to Judah the seed in which Yahweh shall give to him of his young woman. And Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, the bridegroom and the bride, the wedding supper happening. And he went into her, and Yahweh gave her conception, and she bore a son. And the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be Yahweh, who has not left you this day without a kinsman redeemer. And may his name be called in Israel, Yahshua, hallelujah. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. And your daughter-in-law, who loves you, has borne him, who is better to you than seven sons. Why is he saying that? Because Leah had six. Leah had six, Rachel only had two, and the two concubines had two. So he's saying he's better than seven sons. Seven also being the number of completion. And Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became nurse to him. Almost reminds you of Moses with uh, his mother. You know, you lay it down before Yahweh, and Yahweh gives it back. And the neighboring woman gave him a name saying, This is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So what a believable, unbelievable story. And the father of David is the father of Yeshua, going down the same lineage. Two houses restored only by the true kinsmen. And like I said, better than seven sons, because only one is qualified. To redeem. So I find, just like the, the Song of Solomon, which is a beautiful love story of Yeshua for his bride, I find the same thing here in the book of Ruth. I think the book of Ruth is just a beautiful story of redemption, and that, like I said today, for every single person who lives every day really understanding who they are and understanding the love we have for this land, understanding how much we want the Messiah to return and we want to come back here for permanency. I find no, no, no greater book or story in the Bible that gives us hope for the future than the book of Ruth. Yahweh bless.